Emily, what's on your radar? Well, the Biden administration is on the verge of making a massive political and moral error, and nobody is talking about it. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg once denounced the policy that Biden ed Biden's education department is in the process of resurrecting. It's that bad. So the Obama administration reinterpreted Title IX through dear colleague letters on sexual assault and gender identity. Again, it was such a disaster that RBG herself slammed the sexual assault regulations, quote, for not giving the accused person a fair opportunity to be heard, end quote. Now, remember, by the way, the administration made these sweeping changes, transforming the process for adjudication at every school that took federal money, basically every school, with a letter signed by DC bureaucrats. A report this month in the Washington Post says Biden's education department is on the verge of releasing its own Title IX guidance on both sexual assault and gender identity, predictably planning to shift back to Obama era rules. So let's start with sexual assault. We talked about this last summer when Catherine Lehman was being confirmed to her post at the Department of Education. I've since learned how to pronounce her name correctly. Her prior stint at the Office of Civil Rights was such an abject disaster that when Betsy DeVos, one of the media's favorite targets in the Trump administration, revised the rules from layman's time under Obama, even the Washington Post editorial board applauded DeVos. It's a testament to the political machine that layman wasn't run out of town, but is now actually back in the same post under Biden. And as I noted last year, the guidance issued in 2011 and enforced adamantly by Lehman after she joined the department made federal funding contingent upon schools denying due process rights to accused students, denying cross-examinations, requiring a, quote, preponderance of evidence standard over the clear and convincing or beyond a reasonable doubt, and defining sexual violence broadly to include rape, sexual assault, sexual battery, and sexual coercion, but with zero definitions of what those mean. Emily Yaffe also reported in The Atlantic that that guidance, quote, also characterized sexually harassing behavior as, quote, any unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, including remarks. Now, Obama's experiment did not go well. We have the evidence of that. A vast bipartisan swath of legal experts, including the ACLU, agreed on that. It was a travesty. But the department wasn't content to cast higher education sexual assault trials into chaos. Late in his term, Obama's education department also sent another Dear Colleague letter, this time forcing schools that take federal funding to interpret on the basis of sex to include gender identity. As the Post wrote this month, Title IX bars discrimination on the basis of sex in education, and the new rules would make clear this includes discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, among other things, according to two people familiar with a draft of the proposed regulation who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to publicly comment on the subject. That battle is obviously being fought bitterly in states around the country right now, from women's sports to intimate facilities like restrooms. The federal government wants to decide who wins that battle from its perch in Washington, D.C., overriding whatever localities has chosen, have chosen is best for their communities. If, like me, you feel enormous sympathy for kids suffering from gender dysphoria and just want them to be safe, and healthy at school, I can understand how it may seem like common sense to write gender identity into Title IX. Perhaps we may disagree on the value of gender affirmation as a treatment for dysphoria, but we do not disagree on the importance of protecting vulnerable children. Yet this sweeping federal decision will indeed hurt women in sports, of course, and in intimate facilities. Again, even if you support trans ideology broadly, sex is its own category for a reason. Title IX, which turns 50 this year, has long been seen as a major feminist milestone, especially for women's sports. So while Democrats celebrate Title IX this year, they're also actively weakening it and weakening the cause they claim to champion. The problem is not just isolated isolated to one person here or there. This is affecting entire leagues and undercutting all of the blood, sweat, and tears women put into their sports and into their lives. Where are Republicans on this? Basically, nobody talked about the likelihood Biden's education department would do this back in 2020 when he was running. Nobody was talking about it. It wasn't an issue in the primaries or the general election, which is wildly disproportionate to its effect on the country. Conversation about it now is basically relegated to conservative groups and some conservative media outlets. In the absence of Republican courage to fight back when Democrats pick, when Democrats pick these fights, a whole lot of kids got hurt under Obama. 
they suffered. The culture lurched in a direction even most moderates are uncomfortable with. So when a draft regulation is now under review at the White House, why is the pressure now not so immense on the Biden administration that they're forced to defend this politically and morally terrible policy? It's a huge deal for the kids and a winnable fight the GOP is choosing to set out. Ryan, you'll note it's not even literally on my radar whether Democrats would pick up this mantle at all, but that's my question to you. These Title IX regulations on sexual assault, let's just start with that, were a disaster under the Obama administration to the point where Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the ACLU, tons of legal experts came out against them and then in favor of what Betsy DeVos did um, to shift them and change them and improve them. Why on earth why on earth is the Biden administration okay with uh, Catherine Lehman, you know, going back to the Obama years? It's not good for anybody, it seems. I remember when those DeVos regulations uh, came out, and nobody is a, you know, has, has more credibility as a card-carrying DeVos hater than me. I, mean, yeah, I, I actually helped say. publish a book about her, uh, which had a great title, "Schoolhouse Wreck." Very proud of that still. Uh, she's the worst. She's, she's just absolutely the worst. And I remember when those when her rules came out, reading them being like, this is actually pretty reasonable. Like, so, so I was definitely primed to think that uh, Betsy DeVos had, you know, re rewritten rules around sexual assault that would, uh, you know, allow perpetrators to, you know, to to, you know, escape justice. But that wasn't the case. It was just some, you know, very basic protections to try to try and, you know, prevent situations like similar to the one that we had with Rolling Stone, which yes. and people in this people in the survivor justice world know that high profile false allegations are extremely damaging to survivors. Like that's that's far more damaging than requirements of kind of basic due process because you need the public to buy into the process so that once the process is complete, people then get some closure because they say, okay, you know, we have a system in place. It went through that system. This is what the system adjudicated. We as a community, we as a public, you know, have faith in that process. If people don't have faith in that process, then victims, survivors don't get, don't get closure and don't get justice either. And so why they would choose to go back to those, uh, I think has to do with the kind of concentration of uh, motivation among supporters and a, and a lack of motivation among opponents. In other words, the people who really strongly support these, you know, this this new process, you know, it's their highest priority. Like this is the thing that they're driving through the bureaucracy. Whereas the people who are opposed to it are like, I'm opposed to that, but there are 99 other things that I'm working on inside the administration. And do I really want to be the person inside the administration who's the person who's like against tighter rules around sexual assault? So I think right. that's the bureaucratic dynamic that allows this to just to go another step forward, another step forward, another step forward. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, the, you're heading into the summer before the midterms, like we're going to do this. And also we're going to pick a fight over gender identity in college sports. Yeah. I think that is exactly well said, the concentration of, of motivation and the lack of flexibility that those highly motivated people have. Um, one more quick question, Ryan, before we wrap. I'm curious, as a, you know, this affects every single school, basically. If you're taking federal funding, this affects you on both levels, Title IX and, and uh, sexual assault and gender identity. What explains the media's like, relative lack of uh, curiousness or coverage of this, do you think? And they, they're, I mean, the media is not great about covering things that are forward looking. I think, you know, mm -hmm. once once you get some cases, then you'll start to see the, uh, a media swarm and then you'll see some investigations into how did this possibly happen? Uh, that's you know, that that tends to be the media is much more kind of backward looking and needs needs like high profile it needs needs pictures. It needs names. It needs cases. They just don't operate kind of on the plane of ideas. Yeah, I know it's amazing even in that context because they have you know eight years of well not eight years right but, they could you know, go they have back five years right. of Obama right well that's yeah. a no but that makes a lot of sense. Um, next up, the nonprofit at the center of the lab leak theory, Eco Health Alliance, is in hot water once again. No surprise there. We're gonna break it down for you next.